after two and a half years, we are winding down the book of John and uh, 1 John. And we will see where we go from here. I was in the hospital last week uh, due to what they call a mini stroke. Uh, praise the Lord, I don't have any physical limitations. I do have a headache about every morning, uh, but uh, nothing, nothing severe. Well, I was laying there and uh, getting my vitals taken. I heard something over the intercom. It said, Code Blue, Code Blue, Code Blue, over the intercom, which means immediately drop what you're doing and go to uh, the emergency. Somebody is dying. Now, nobody on the medical team that was involved looked around and went, Me? I don't know whether I'll go or not. I don't know whether I'll partake or not. Uh, because it meant that someone is passing away quickly and do what you can to revive them, uh, help them out. In the Christian faith, we have code blue all of the time. Unfortunately, there's very few that respond. If you found 1 John 5, 16 to 17, would you stand with the reading of God's word, please? If anyone sees his brother, and I also incorporate sister there, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and will, he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that we come together. Lord, and as we hear this message, allow us to be challenged to accept that call as we hear over the intercom, quote blue. Lord, I pray that we will respond the appropriate way. And Lord, that we will stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Notice that in 1 John, verse 15, it says, If anyone, anyone. In other words, if you are a brother and sister in Christ, you are the anyone. Sees a brother or sister sinning. It is our duty to get involved. We do not want people dying on our shift. We do not want to be unaware, but we must carry something with us called love as we try to help out our brother and sister. But how is it in our control? How is it that we can be involved? How is it uh, that we can watch from the sidelines and say, this is where I can be in control of. This is what I can do. It is called prayer. Pray. We spend so much time gossiping about other people and their sin. And, and I know why we do this. It's to elevate ourselves. Well, at least I'm not like them. At least I, I'm not as bad as they are. We are, but at least I'm not like that person. That sounds more like a Pharisee. If you remember in Scripture, it talks about the Pharisee who stands in the uh, uh, prayer room, beats his chest, and says, Lord, thank you, thank you, that I am not like this sinner. Thank you that I'm not like this person i don't walk the road that he walks i'm not as bad as he is and the one who is the sinner is kneeling down and praying to the lord that he would forgive that person it's so good to or so easy rather 
to come to church every year, every Sunday, and think that we are a good person. That's what we found out on Friday night, that many people bases their salvation on being a good person. But when we compare ourselves to just the Ten Commandments, we see that we have fallen. We see that in every situation, do we honor the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind? Do we talk bad about God? You see, every time that says, do not take the name of the Lord in vain, we immediately think about people who curse the name of God. Did you know that is not what that verse is about? Now, I agree we shouldn't be doing that, but that's not what that verse means. Here's what that verse means. The verse means do not give God lip service. And there are far more who do that than to curse the name of the Lord. Make promises to God that we will do and we don't fulfill it is lip service. Trying to live a godly life but having the wrong motives is lip service. We must admit who we are and we admit that according to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us who is breathing, you all are breathing today, right? All of us who are breathing are sinners. That's why we need a Savior. And Jesus was the only one who could fulfill that on the cross. And on his resurrection, he rose a third day to show that we can have victory and we can overcome the world. But it is not by our goodness. Because no matter how we measure up, we just are not good enough. And when we sin, and we see others sinning, we need to pray. Not cast judgment upon them, but pray. Not talk bad about them, but to pray. Many people do not understand the power of prayer. Do you know what prayer really is? It is communication with Almighty God. It's our communication service. And sometimes, just like our cell phones, it gets disconnected because we are not in the right standing but when we are in the right standing and when we pray, folks, things happen. Not because of us, but because of Him. It is earth getting in touch with heaven or bringing heaven down to earth. Back in the 80s and the early 90s, there was a big controversy of Christian artists who had been in the Billboard charts. Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, Bob Carlyle and his Butterfly Kisses. They all made the Billboard charts. And Christians got upset because what have they done? Have they really traded their Christianity for the world? Have they really jumped ship? And so many Christians said, I'm not listening anymore to their music. I'm not supporting them. And yet, really, the lyrics had not changed. And many people would not have known the difference. But they turned their back on them. And they said, well, they must not be a Christian. But if you went to the concerts, they would give an evangel uh, evangelist-type service concert who needs an evangelist type service more than the world but they turned their back on them 
And then something really interesting happens, not just recently, but it has happened before. But have you heard Jelly Roll's song, God's Favor? People said, well, he must be a Christian. He's singing about God. Have you read his bio? He's not a Christian. He's not a Christian. But we look at that and go, oh, my goodness, hurry up. He's a Christian because he sings a Jesus song. Many people who sing a Jesus song doesn't mean they're Christian. Yeah. Yes, yes. So what should we do? Instead of casting judgment upon Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, and Bob Carlisle, we should pray for them. We should support them. Now, they're gone, and there's other people who have made the billboard charts. But we should pray for them. If you see a brother or a sister sinning, it is not time to gossip about them. It is time to pray for them that they are led by God. When we see a Christian sinning, our first step ought to be to pray for them, not turning our back. We are to have an accountability partner. We are to, po- we are to have a support system, and the church is real good for that if they're willing to step up and be in accountability. One of the stories that I loved, and I heard my mom tell the story before, Johnny Cash and Waylon uh, Jennings were, were talking, and one of them was on the Johnny Carson show. And they, Johnny Carson was talking to him, and he said, you know, I have Johnny Cash or, or Waylon Jennings as my accountability partner. And when I really feel uh, tempted to, have, to, to do drugs, and we know that the other one was just the same, I call that person. And Johnny Carson said, do you talk about drugs? And the other person said, no, we don't talk about drugs at all. We talk about everything else besides the drugs. And whenever we get done, after that couple of hours, that addiction is gone. We need people who are accountability partners that will say, I will hold you to the flame, you hold me to the flame. And we will support each other. When you see me going down the wrong path, you say something. And when I see you going down the wrong path, you say, I'll, I'll say something to you. We need to help each other. And quite honestly, this is what my dad always said. Whenever I wanted to fight or what I called wrestling, he said, boy... There's work to be done around here. And whenever you get done with your work, you're going to be so tired, you're not going to want to fight. You're going to want to go to bed. He always believed in the work ethic. And if you have time to fool around with fighting or whatever that is on the wrong path, then he has work for me. I always said, Dad, I want a weightlifting machine. He said, you don't need a weightlifting machine. He said, go get a load of wood. That'll, that'll be your weightlifting machine. He always was believing in work ethic. He didn't work us to death, but he believed in a strong work ethic. Accountability is not to tear one another down and say, aha, I got you, but it is to do it in love, to lift one up. I have told the people in the hospital whenever I was there I have many mamas in the church I have many mamas in the church and if I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing I hear about it when I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing I hear about it but why do they do that they don't do that because they want my demise they do that because they love me and they want me to succeed the way God wants to succeed. We hear many times here in 1 John 15 and 
16 about a sin leading to death and many scholars sit around a table and talk about what is this sin that leads to death here's what you get whenever you get many scholars around the table they enter the room they discuss it they argue about it and when they get up an hour later they're holding the same views that they ha as they had they just say well that was a good wrestling match but hardly do they ever change for the better many people debate this sin leading to death well we have an example of that don't we if you turn to acts chapter 5 verses 1 to 11 turn to acts chapter 5 1 to 11 i want you to look at it in your own bible we have two people we have two people that leads us to this example of sin leading to death And it says this, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a, possess sold a possession, and he kept packed part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Well, that's nice. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the piece of the land for yourself while it remained was it not your own and after it was sold was it not in your own control why have you conceived this thing in your heart you have not lied to men you have lied to God then Ananias hearing these words fell down and breathed his last so great fear came upon all those who heard these things and the young men arose and wrapped him up carried him out and buried him now it was about three hours later when his wife came in not knowing what had happened and Peter uh, and Peter answered her tell me whether you sold the land for so much she said yes for so much then Peter said to her how is it that you have agreed together to uh, test the spirit of the Lord look the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out then he immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed his last and the young men came in and found her dead and carried her out buried her by her husband so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things we have other examples we have Moses who was leading the people who was doing a good job but disobeyed God and all he could do was see the promised land. Reminds me of a video that I saw. This little boy, about six or seven years old, was so excited about Legoland in Orlando, Florida. He wanted to go to the amusement park, Legoland. And his mom and dad thought about doing a cruel joke on him. What they did was they took the little boy, and he was in the vehicle, and they drove past Legoland. He got excited as he was getting. He's like, do we get to go to Legoland? Do we get to go to Legoland? You know, much like the kids whenever McDonald's is closed. Do we get to go to Legoland? And like, maybe. I don't know. And so as he got there, he's like, Legoland! But they went past. He's like, oh, man. I can picture that with Moses. We're going to the promised land. We're going to the promised land. All he could do because of his disobedience was see it, not live in it. How disappointing. We have a couple of people who you probably have not heard of. They were Nadab and Abihu. This is found in Leviticus 10, 1 through 2. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. You may read those things and think, well, those are interesting stories. Uh, 
but are they true? And do they happen today? My dad, who was a pastor, uh, would talk about this man who would walk forward. And he would kneel at the altar. Uh, they, really, they used to do that, uh, kneel at the altar. And he would beg dad to pray for him. The thing that he wanted him to pray for was that the Lord would speak to him one more time. He said, you see, the Lord is speaking to me that I needed to get saved. And I said, no, 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 I won't. No, I'm not interested. No, I, I have plenty of time. And God had co stopped communicating to this man about his salvation. And so he, da as dad was kneeling down beside him, he said, please, please pray that God will speak to me one more time. We don't know whether God spoke to him one more time or not. He may have died in his trespasses and sin. Sometimes that happens with people who are followers of Jesus Christ. My dad, we call it surrender to the ministry for a reason. When someone says, I surrender to the ministry, it means I fought and fought and fought and fought and fought, and finally God won by me surrendering and saying, okay, God. But that's what happened to my dad. First of all, he's a, he was a music lover. He loved listening to the radio and the old classic country songs, and he would drive to work at Mobile Chemical in Jacksonville, and he'd be listening to the music. Something very strange happened. I say strange because he has had the radio looked at many, many times and the people who were the mechanics and the electricians said, there is no reason why this radio would not work. But every time he turned it on, it did not work. And Dad began to get the idea. It was not something that was physical. It was something that God wanted him to hear because when he drove to work, he had to be quiet because there was no radio. Well, there was a revival, and I was sick at every revival. I, I told someone this morning, you know, I can't wait to get to heaven because I've not been well any time in my life. And I can't wait to get to heaven just to know what it is like to be well. To be healed, that would be wonderful. But I was sick during revival, and Mom and Dad said, you know, there's a room in the back. You can just lay on a cot, just minister is really 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 good and you would enjoy him w would you come and lay in the back and i said i would because i always enjoyed revivals and so i laid in the back and about the invitation time i felt a whole lot better almost like i was well from what i was experiencing and i got up i thought i'll go out to the sanctuary i got up and as i walked I was walking out the door my mom was walking in and she said, your dad has surrendered to the ministry. Would you like to go see him? I said, yes. Now, I don't remember this, but this is what dad told me, or has told other people in my presence. He said that I went to him, and I said, thank you, dad. Thank you for surrendering to the ministry. Because if you would not have done that, I would have died. You see, God is serious about our sin and we may say well surrendering to the ministry isn't all that bad not surrendering to the ministry is not all that bad but you see there's no degrees of sin sin is sin and when god says something we need to respond to it sin leading to death is when we finally say no, God, I am not listening to you. And sometimes that's in our salvation when God speaks to us and says, you know, you really need to be saved, and we keep on putting him off. Sometimes that's leading to death. Sometimes it's disobedience. Those who are Christians who are disobedient, and they say no. Why? Because there is nothing else that can be done about this person. When we pray, it is a matter of life and death. Those who God had uh, has uh, speaking to, 
it is of no use if they say, no, no, thank you, I don't want to do that. God may have said, enough is enough. When one dies after a call of code blue, they don't continue to work on them because they are gone. When God has stopped speaking, we stop praying because they have said no for the last time. But until then, until you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, the issue is not not praying, but it is pray. Pray with all your might. Pray for life. It's not too late until God has turned his back on that person for their disobedience. While there is still hope, keep praying. It is a matter of life and death. Is there a choice? Notice that John did not give the listeners a choice. He didn't say, well, if you don't want to pray for them, it's okay. I understand if, if you've had enough of them, if you prayed, it's all right. No. He said, if anyone finds a brother or sister in sin, pray. If anyone, it doesn't matter if you know them or not. You may have heard about them from somebody. It doesn't matter if you know them or not. Pray. It doesn't matter if you don't like them or not. Pray. We are called to pray for one another. And John doesn't give them a choice. He says to pray. But I want to say this to those who are helpers. I have a really good friend in Celebrate Recovery. His name is Junior. And I'm trying to get through, through to him. And I will continue to try to get through with it to him. He heard about my mini stroke. And he said, I don't want to get into your business or anything, but how are you doing? And I said this. I said, when you are a dear friend and you're asking how somebody is doing, that's not getting in somebody's business. That is caring. Many times we say, well, I don't want to get involved because it's none of my business. Well, it is our business. If we see a brother or sister sinning, it is our business to get involved because we are called to by Jesus Christ but those who are getting involved I want to give you a warning it comes from 1 Corinthians 10 12 therefore let him who thinks he stands or is standing take heed lest he fall if you are dealing with the same problem if you are dealing and it is a temptation for you be careful there are some things that i am not allowed to get involved in what i will do if i see a sister sinning i will get a hold of a sister and say hey would you go check them out and help them out and and do that same way with a sister towards a brother too many things happens we have a temptation i would not call someone who is weak in alcoholism to go minister to an alcoholic or a druggie or a codependent or a person with anger issues because when we think we're doing all right we're not i speak about this a lot in celebrate recovery but when linda's birthday comes april the 23rd i don't usually lose it i think i'm going to i think there's going to be a problem i'm like okay brace yourself you can do this april 23rd comes and goes i'm like wow i must be doing pretty good and then i'll hear a song and break down because I was standing firm, but I wasn't aware that that was going to be a trigger for me. Be careful. Know yourself and what your weakness is. 
whenever someone is called for a code blue. Even today, uh, as I was laying in the hospital bed, one thing that I noticed is that the nurses and doctors are still wearing masks. And I'm like, COVID's over with. But they're still wearing masks. And when they touch you, they still put on plastic gloves. And if you're bad enough, they'll put on a plastic gown. Why is that? Because they don't want your disease to affect them. And so they will take precautions to protect themselves from what you have and what I have. We can do that in our Christian life. What is our protection? First of all, our protection is the Bible and knowing it, not just carrying it. Second of all is prayer, that we are prayed up. And third of all is the Holy Spirit protects us, but we must listen to it. Sin can be contagious like attitudes. Misery loves company. And we must take warning of that. Doesn't mean we don't help. It means we protect ourselves by being under the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember the story in the beginning about the code blue. Hearing over the intercom, code blue, go blue, come quickly. You know what's sad is if I heard, we have a code blue, and it's silent. Code blue, we have a code blue, code blue, and nobody responds. Code blue, code blue, we have a code blue. And then finally, even the intercom is quiet. You know what we have in the Christian life? Code blue. Code blue. We have a code blue. Code blue. People are following. I was discouraged for a while, and then I realized I had to check myself. Pastor after pastor after pastor, ones I knew, not just those in the media, following, doing something out of God's will. Adultery, being drunk, doing all sorts of things. And I look at them and I say, but they, they're Christians. The problem is they should know better. They preach God's word. Code blue. Code blue. I see brothers and sisters who were strong in the faith years ago who are no longer following Jesus. Code blue. Code blue. Churches are closing all of the time and people are walking away from their faith. Code blue. Code blue. You know what the saddest part of that is? Christians who are showing that they just don't care and don't respond. If anyone sees a brother or sister sinning, Pray for them. Lift them up and be the witness that we're all called to be. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we are challenged in our minds, in our hearts. Lord, that we are witnesses for you. And when we hear that code blue from heaven, that we will respond. Lord, if there's someone here who does not know you, Lord, I pray that they will respond before it's too late. And you say enough is enough. Lord, break our heart for lost people. Break our heart for brothers and sisters who are sinning. And Lord, we pray that you will lift them up. In Jesus' name, amen.